As always, if you haven't done so yet, pause the video and try to answer the question first on your own before listening on. Initially, we have a proton and an alpha particle that are separated by this distance that's stated in the question, and then they are released, they fly apart from one, from one another, and they end up with some final velocity, and they're also very, very far apart in the final scenario. And one way to begin solving for their final velocities would be to use the conservation of energy. Now, initially, the only energy that is present is the electrical potential energy, which for now we can just call PE. So that's the only energy present. And then when they are released and move very far apart from one another, because they're so far apart, there no longer will be any electrical potential energy, but that energy will now be converted into kinetic energy, which we can symbolize by Ke final. Through the conservation of energy, these two energies would be equal to one another. So we can actually come up here and set them equal to each other. And then we can fill in the known expressions for electrical potential energy as well as kinetic energy. Electrical potential energy between two charges is simply K multiplied by the first charge multiplied by the second charge divided by the distance between them. Notice we've labeled that distance R sub I in the diagram. And then the final kinetic energies would be the kinetic energy of the proton, which would be one half times the mass of the proton times the speed of the proton squared. And then we add that to the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. So one half times the mass of the alpha particle times the speed of the alpha particle squared. Now we actually know all the values on the left hand side of this equation. K is a constant. The charges are given in the question. We know that a proton has a charge of positive E and then the alpha particle has a charge of 2e, and then the distance between them is given in the question. So we'll go ahead and actually plug in those known values. Note that e is equal to 1.6 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. That is the standard elementary unit charge. So we'll plug in k, both q's, as well as the distance. So there are all the values plugged in. We can actually pick up our calculator and crunch the quantity on the left-hand side down. And we end up with 1.15 times 10 to the minus 13th. Notice that the unit is joules. And the reason for that is we have a coulombs times a coulombs, which is coulombs squared, which cancels with the coulombs squared here. And then we have a meters in the denominator, a meters squared here. We can cancel one factor of the meter squared, leaving us with newtons times a meter, which of course is joules. We could next multiply both sides of this equation by 2. And by doing that, when we distribute the 2 on the right-hand side, we'll have 2 times a half, which is 1, so it cancels out that half, and then same thing with the other half. The quantity on the left side becomes 2.30 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. Now we do know the mass of a proton. We could look that up, and the mass of the alpha particle was given to us but we don't know the speed of the proton or the speed of the alpha particle. So we have one equation here with two unknowns, and this is why we're not going to be able to find their speeds or velocities by only using conservation of energy. It's not enough. We're going to need another equation. So for part A, we know that the conservation of energy isn't enough because one equation with two unknowns will not allow us to solve for the unknowns. For part B, it asks what other conservation law can be applied, and that would be the conservation of momentum. And that's actually what we're going to use to find their speeds for part C. So let's look at the conservation of momentum next. Initially, the particles are at rest, so that means that the initial momentum would actually equal zero. After they fly apart and travel to a very far distance away from each other, the final momentum would be the mass of the proton multiplied by the velocity of the proton plus the mass of the alpha particle times the velocity of the alpha particle. Through the conservation of momentum, we can actually set the initial momentum equal to the final momentum. So now we have a second equation with the same unknowns, the velocity of the proton and the velocity of the alpha particle. So this is getting us closer to solving this. Let's try to isolate V alpha in this equation right here. So we're going to subtract MPVP over to the other side of the equation. And then we'll divide both sides by the mass of the alpha particle. So this gives us an expression for V alpha. We can take this expression for V alpha 
and we can actually plug it into the first equation that we had developed right there. So we've made that substitution up here, and if you look carefully, you'll notice there's only one unknown now, the velocity of the proton. So we're going to try to isolate the velocity of the proton and then plug in the known information. Now, one way of doing that would be to square both the numerator of this fraction as well as the denominator. Notice when you square the numerator, this negative sign is going to become positive because a negative times a negative will become a positive quantity. So we'll square both the numerator and the denominator next. And the numerator will have the mass of the proton squared, the velocity of the proton squared, divided by the mass of the alpha particles squared. Notice we have a factor of mass alpha and mass alpha right here. So one factor will cancel in the numerator and one factor will cancel in the denominator. That leaves us with a mass of alpha in the denominator here. We will next notice that there is a common factor of vp squared in this term as well as in that term right there. So we will factor out that vp squared. And what is left behind is the mass of the proton plus the mass of the proton squared over the mass of the alpha particle. Now since we have multiplication of this large term in parentheses, that means we can divide the opposite, divide both sides of the equation by that large term. Now by dividing by that large term on the right hand side, we can see that that term will actually cancel out. And that's going to leave us with just vp squared. And then finally we can take the square root and by square rooting the vp squared, that's going to change it into just vp, the velocity of the proton. So at this point, we can now plug in the known values. The mass of the proton appears twice in the denominator here, and then the mass of the alpha particle is given. You'd have to look up the mass of the proton, and that should be about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So we'll come over here and solve for vp by plugging in all the values. Don't forget to square the mass of the proton in the numerator of this fraction here. When you do that, you should get 1.05 times 10 to the power of 7. The unit will come out to meters per second because we've used all standard units, so we can be assured of that. This would be the correct answer for the speed of the proton. We know that the velocity of the alpha particle is given by this expression. There is a negative sign on it, but remember, the question is asking us for the speeds and speeds are never negative, they're always positive quantities. So to find the speed, we can actually take the absolute value of both sides of this equation here, and that will render the speed a positive value. So we'll plug in the mass of the proton, the speed of the proton that we just found, and then the mass of the alpha particle. And when you work that out, you should get about 2.64 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. So that would be the speed of the alpha particle. Thus, we have the correct answers to part C.